So we're going to still talk about the resurrection. That's what this weekend is for. But I want to do it from a little different angle. I want to think about important meetings where people come together, and because of that conversation, it changes everything. If you think about when Gorbachev got together as with President Reagan, and there was a discussion of how to bring the Cold War to an end. There was a huge face-to-face -face meeting. You think about when President Nixon brought Yitzhak Rabin and, and Yasser Arafat, who were at war in Israel. They brought them together in an attempt to make peace as heads of state, as important people come together to have these discussions. And I'm going to be talking to you about some of those kinds of meetings that went on. And the first one was between Jesus and Pilate. And they had this incredible conversation, series of conversations. And as a part of that, you see that Jesus brought it all down to wrestling with the truth. What is true, what is real, what matters, what lasts, what do we live for? And so let me give you a little backstory on this. Jesus. He was born about 33 years before this, and there was a few special things about his birth, you know, angels and fulfilling prophecy and that sort of thing. But for 30 years, basically, he was just a quiet peasant. He was either a carpenter or a stonemason in a little town of Nazareth. And then three years before this meeting, he started coming out publicly and teaching and healing and feeding the multitudes, and, and he began rising in popularity. And just a couple of weeks before this, he had actually raised Lazarus from the dead. And that was like the fuse that lit the final bit. And so as he's becoming more popular and more known, there's rising opposition from the Jewish authorities. And they decide <laughs> after he raises Lazarus from the dead that the only solution is to kill him and to kill Lazarus. So last week we talked about the people who have the most information are not always the ones who respond with faith, who believe the truth. Sometimes you can see something as very true and deny it. So Jesus comes to this conversation. He's been betrayed by some of his closest followers, paid off by the Jewish authorities. He's been through an all-night trial with the different Jewish leadership groups who are trying to find a good case, a good way, so that they can not just stop him, so that they can kill him. And so they come and they bring him to Pilate's palace. Now, Pilate is the other person in this important meeting. He was born in the middle of Italy. He was connected to the emperor Tiberius. And so he got assigned to be the prefect or the governor of this land of this province of Judea, they called it. And I don't know if that was a promotion or a demotion to be in charge of that rock pile that was uh, full of civil unrest because there had been so many rebellions and so many wars there already, that it was a tough assignment. And Pilate was not known. In the story in the Bible, it looks like he's kind of wishy-washy, like he can't make up his mind. But that's not true from history. He was violent. He was oppressive. He didn't care about the Jewish sensibilities. He did brought images into the city of Jerusalem just to tick them off. And so the story of his life, we're seeing one small, incredibly important moment at which he had an opportunity to recognize what the truth was. The other part of the back story is this is Passover. Passover was the time when all the Jewish men were supposed to return to Jerusalem, and so the population of Jerusalem swelled like three times its normal size. Most of it was a male population, and guess what they were celebrating? When the imprisoned Jewish people got freed from their oppressors, the Egyptians. So they were celebrating political freedom. They were celebrating throwing off the oppressor. How do you think they felt about the Romans about that time? So this whole place was a powder keg. You got all these men that have come. They're talking about freedom, and Pilate is just trying to keep a lid on this powder keg. It could blow up so badly for him. So he's trying to maintain his power, his control, and there are these conversations. And what you begin to see, I believe, is that Pilate is conflicted. One part of him says, hang on to your job, be a Roman, scrunch, scrush, crush this rebellion. And the other part of him says, what if it's true? What if this is real? 
because I think he's very early on convinced that Jesus is innocent. Let's read in, in chapter 27 of the book of Matthew. I'm going to start in verse 11. It said, Meanwhile, Jesus stood before the governor, and the governor said, Are you the king of the Jews? That was the charge. You have said so, said Jesus. And when he was accused by the chief priests and elders, he gave no answer. Then Pilate asked him, Don't you hear the testimony they're bringing against you? But Jesus made no reply, not even to a single charge, to the great amazement of the governor. In fact, the book of John tells us there's a little private conversation here where Jesus says, I am a king, but my kingdom is not of this world. I'm a different kind of king than you think. And, and there's this process where Pilate says to him, why don't you answer me? Don't you know I have the power to kill you or to set you free? And Jesus looks at him and says, no, you don't. You don't have any power at all except what my Father gives you. And there's this conflictual meeting of the head of the Roman state in this area and the head of the spiritual state, which is Jesus. And so he goes on and he says, it was the governor's custom at the festival to release a prisoner chosen by the crowd. At that time, they had a well-known prisoner whose name was Jesus, Barabbas. And then he had another prisoner, Jesus the Messiah. So he said, which one do you want me to release to you, Jesus Barabbas or Jesus who's called the Messiah? For he knew it was out of self-interest that they had handed Jesus over to him. So here's a, here's a moment where we get a look inside Pilate. He's dealing with, the way I read the story, they woke him up early in the morning. He's not a good morning person. He's a little cranky. Then they make him go outside the palace, which if you understand anything about Jewish customs, this is kind of sad, humorous. They didn't want to go inside the Gentiles' palace because then they would be unclean and they couldn't celebrate the Passover. So they were planning murder, but they were trying to do it in a religiously acceptable fashion. So you have this contrast between what's going on in the political world and what's going on in their hearts, and they were filled with anger and murder. And Pilate sees that. You see, Pilate is a political animal. The Roman Empire was full of people squashing each other to get into positions of authority and bailing on each other and assassinating each other. And he looks out at that group and it says, he knew it was out of self-interest that they handed Jesus over. This guy's not a criminal. This guy's not dangerous. You guys are doing this out of envy. You are afraid he's too popular. You see, the, the Pharisees had in their mind that in order for them to win, Jesus had to lose. And conversely, the, the fear that if Jesus won, they would lose. And so they were set out, even though they had seen Lazarus raised from the dead, some of them, they still said, the truth is inconvenient. I'll tell you, the truth is almost always inconvenient. The truth is always uncomfortable. And the truth makes you change. And he's brought to this wrestling match, and he knows it's all out of a political play. And then it goes on and it says, Pilate was sitting on the judge's seat and his wife sent him this message. Don't have anything to do with that innocent man for I have suffered a great deal today in a dream because of him. So Pilate's in this early morning trial with people who won't even come into his palace and he's hard at work and his wife sends him a text. <laughs> I'm interfering in your case. I'm going to tell you what to do. That, does that ever happen to you? That's just frustrating. And he's going like, what? But you know, I think you can see in the story that it goes from being professional to being personal. That his wife warns him. And, and I don't know how you do when you're going through a hard thing, but Jesus had already wrestled with the truth that in order for him to pay for the sins of the world, he had to die on the cross. He had to take this cup of suffering. He had already wrestled with the truth and he had said, your will, not mine. And now he's just getting through it. And I don't know about you when you're going through facing a surgery or a hard thing. It's like sometimes I just want to get my head down and just kind of get through it. And what I'm amazed at as I read through the story of Easter this year is that in the middle of knowing he was going to suffer even more and in the middle of his suffering, he had these incredible conversations where here's Pilate, this <laughs> not a likely convert. And he says to him several things. Because Pilate goes out, first of all, and he tries to free Jesus. He says, Jewish leaders, you have your own laws. Why don't you take care of him? And they said, that's because we want to crucify him and we don't have permission to do that. And it's interesting because he had to be crucified 
not stoned to fulfill the prophecies. And so they came and they said, we want him to be crucified. And I think Pilate knew he was innocent right away. He knew it was just a political deal. I think as you go through this process, Pilate begins to think maybe he's something special. Because he has this conversation with Jesus and he said, you are a king then. And Jesus says, I am a king, but not, not of this world. Like, if I were, wouldn't my followers be fighting for me? And that makes sense to, to Pilate. He says, yeah, I get that. And then, and then Jesus leans in further and he says to him, everyone on the side of truth listens to me. You see, he's told him that, Pilate, you don't have any authority, only my father does. He's told him, and his wife has told him, watch out, this guy's an innocent man. So I think all of these things have caused Pilate, who's this cruel Roman leader, I think he's gone to that place internally, like, what if it's true? What if this is the truth? In fact, there's this one little phrase that says, when he heard that they thought he might be the son of God, he was even more afraid. I think Pilate had an inclination that this wasn't just an innocent man, maybe not just a special guy, that maybe, in fact, he was a son, and in his Roman thinking, probably a son of one of the gods. And all of a sudden, he's in this pressure. What if it's true? If it's true, then my responsibility is to free him. My responsibility is to, who cares what happens to my job? I'm going to lean in to saving him, or I can pull back and save myself. You see, because Pilate now understood to save Jesus, he might lose. And if he won, then Jesus had to lose. He put himself in exactly the same position. And so there's this confliction that's going on inside of him. And what happens is he tries to release Jesus a few times, and then he comes back to this. It says, when Pilate saw he was getting nowhere, but instead an uproar was starting, a riot, he took the water and washed his hands in front of the crowd, I am innocent of this man's blood, he said. It is your responsibility. I don't think this happened often, maybe never, except this time. And he makes this incredible show of taking his hands and washing them and saying, I am not responsible for this decision. But we have to tell Pilate, water doesn't wash away sin, does it? He still made that choice, didn't he? And I think he took this extraordinary measure because I think he realized that this was a huge decision and he was going to opt for saving himself. He was going to opt for control. He was going to opt for the safe route in terms of his tradition and his background. And you know, I personally believe that more people believe that Jesus is real than follow him. And I think it's a lot about, I don't want to lose control. I don't want to, truth is inconvenient. It's going to change my lifestyle. It's going to change my priorities. It's going to change everything. I would rather retain control, which is really strange since we're so bad at it, but we want to hang on to it. Even if Jesus is true, we live like he's not. I'm going to move to another showdown. The soldiers. They were kind of pawns in this game, the, the soldiers that dressed him in a robe and put a crown of thorns on. They were sadistic, obviously. But there was another group of soldiers, and they were thrown into this because the Jewish authorities, they got their way. They had Jesus crucified, and they watched him taken, and they knew that he was dead. And you would have thought they would have held a celebration. But you know what they did instead? It's the day later. The next day, one day after the preparation day, the chief priests and the Pharisees went to Pilate. Sir, they said, we remember that while he was still alive, the deceiver said, after three days I will rise again. So he gave the, or so give the order for the tomb to be made secure until that day. I find this such an ironic thing. His enemies remembered what he said, but his friends didn't. You see, they were paying attention. They knew what Jesus said. They said this deceiver said he was going to rise after three days. Had Jesus said that numerous times? Yeah. But what did his disciples, when they found an empty tomb, what did they think? Somebody moved the body. Right? And I find it fascinating that his enemies were listening closer than his friends. And they said, this guy said he was going to rise again from the dead. Now listen to this. 
Otherwise, his disciples may come and steal the body and tell people that he's been raised from the dead, and this last deception will that we be worse than the first. <gasps> what a tragedy. Now, remember, when we come to the end of this story, this is the story they were afraid of, that his disciples stole his body, and he pretended that, and they pretended that he right, rose from the dead. And so take a guard, Pilate said, go make the tomb as secure as you know how. So they did that. It says they took and made the tomb secure by putting a seal, putting a Roman seal on it with the insignia of the Roman Empire and posting a guard. So they took this place. Don't you think the soldiers must have thought this was a pretty easy assignment? Here all of Jerusalem is going to blow up and what do we have to do? We're guarding a dead man. Ought to be a pretty quiet night. And you know, if the disciples do try to come, they're just a bunch of fishermen and tax collectors. What kind of warriors are those? I mean, even Peter, when he tried to hit somebody with a sword, he took his ear off. I mean, it's like these guys aren't dangerous, right? So the soldiers were there overnight. Now, sometimes we don't think about how did the New Testament get the information it got. I want you to read this next verse with me and realize where the information must have come from. There was a violent earthquake, for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven and going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning and his clothes were as white as snow. And the guards were so afraid of him that they shook and became like dead men. You see, the dead men became alive and the alive men became dead. They saw what happened. Think about it. They were the only ones that saw the actual moment. Remember all the rest of it was the women coming to the tomb and they find an empty tomb and they have a conversation with an angel, but they didn't see the event. There's only a very small group of them that saw the event. And what would you do if you saw the power of God like that? You know, see, some people say, well, if I lived back in the first century and I really saw Jesus do miracles, then I would believe. And my answer to you is no, you wouldn't. You either believe because you trust God and you have faith to believe or you wouldn't believe it even if you saw it. What did the guards do that saw the most impressive display of God's power? They ran and tattletailed back to the Jewish authorities. Now you understand when a Roman soldier loses a prisoner, what happens? Yeah, they, they kind of make them very intent by telling, if you lose that one, you're going to get killed. I don't know what the penalty is for killing a dead, I mean, losing a dead man. That seems like it should be even worse somehow. It's like, how hard? You only had one job to do. And they ran to the Jewish authorities. And they said, I think they told him exactly what happened. I don't think they said we fell asleep and they stole his body. <laughs> what, what kind of gain is that going to give to the guards, right? I think they said, and this happened. And, there, and this guy came down and he was like, he wore clothes, looked like lightning. He was blow, glowing and the, the, the stone moved and, and it knocked them over physically. You think you'd ever forget that? So they tell this story. And what did the Pharisees say? They said, um, you know that story we were afraid of? Here's what we want you to say. You fell asleep and the disciples came and got his body and they're lying. So the story they were thinking was going to be a tragedy is the story they paid for. They gave him a big sum of money and said, tell this story. But you know what? I think some of the soldiers cheated. I think they told this story. I think that's why we know that some of them couldn't get over what had happened because other people saw that empty tomb and they saw the results of the resurrection, but those soldiers saw it happen. And there was a life-changing process that began at that point. The women come to the tomb and they see that it's empty and they, they meet an angel. And the angel says, are you looking for Jesus? Isn't that a great question? I think everybody's looking for Jesus. I think, I think all of us have a Jesus-sized hole in our hearts. And people try to put in success, education, romance, wealth, power. We have, we have all kinds of substitutes that we try to put into that place. But there's an empty spot in us that can only be filled by a relationship with Christ. And the way I know that the resurrection happened is because you watch it in the eyes of the disciples as they came to that point. You probably all of you saw this last week, the, the sad story of the church Notre Dame being burned. And it's tragic that a church that's 800 years old, that took 150 years to build, was destroyed. And I don't know if you saw the other picture, but in the middle of it, there was a picture of a cross that came out and stood. 
And you see, some people were all torn up about the building going down, and they're torn up about there were some supposed relics of the, the original crown of thorns and all of those, like it lasted for 2,000 years. And they were all concerned about that, not about Jesus or the cause of Christ. And somebody told me this morning, there's another church burning. It's in Sri Lanka. There was a Christian church that was bombed on Easter, and 200 believers were killed. So you see the swirl of what's important and what's not and what's true and what isn't true goes on all the time. And the way we know it is that the disciples were transformed. The way we know it's true is we have the accounts of the Gospels and we have all these different stories. The Bible says Jesus appeared to over 500 people after he came back from the dead. And he ate some food in front of them. He showed them the, the marks in his palms or in his wrists. He showed them the, the, the gash in his side, the scar in his side. And we watch them and they turn from hidden to open. And there's two stories that you may not even have caught in the Easter story. And they're after the crucifixion and after Jesus was dead. They're coming up to the preparation day for the Passover and so they want to get the bodies off the crosses. And so it says, Joseph of Arimathea, and he was a, a wealthy man, says he asked Pilate for the body of Jesus. Now Joseph was a disciple of Jesus, but secretly because he feared the Jewish leaders. With Pilate's permission, he came and he took the body away. See, I think there is another group of people who say we believe Jesus is real. We believe he really died and rose again. We believe that this is true, but we don't want to live out the implications of that truth because it might become unpopular. It might make me unpopular. It's uncomfortable. It's inconvenient. And so they had been living in hiddenness, and now he comes forward and he asks Pilate for the body. Talk about putting a target on your back. And there's another cool part of this story. He was accompanied by Nicodemus, the man who earlier had visited Jesus at night. Nicodemus brought a mixture of myrrh and aloes and about 75 pounds. They, they brought spices to put around the body. It was the Jewish burial ritual. But he references the fact that Nicodemus, who was the teacher of Israel, he was a prominent rabbi, and he had come probably a year and a half before, to talk to Jesus at night in John chapter 3. And he says, to, he's asking some spiritual questions of Jesus. And Jesus looks at him and he says, Nicodemus, you must be born again. All your religiousness, all your education, all your moral goodness, none of that matters. You have to come to a personal place of humility and, and acceptance of a relationship with God. You need to be born like all over again. It needs to be a new start for you. It's the same chapter where Jesus says, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. You see, he was leaning in early in his ministry to this guy named Nicodemus who, uh, for whom if he had followed Jesus earlier would have been banished from the synagogues, would have been taken from his position of authority. And now Joseph and Nicodemus are going from being hiding, hiding and lying and hanging out in the background to saying, we're followers of Jesus, we don't care, who knows. You see, I, I think there's a lot more people that admit it that live in fear. They say, I want to follow Jesus, but I'm afraid. I'm afraid of the implications, afraid of the consequences, afraid of the cost. And the disciples who had denied Jesus, who were hiding, who were running, who were, who were doing everything they could to get the spotlight on them, off of them. One of the reasons you know about the resurrection is because of the change in their hearts and their lives. We're going to be doing a series in the next four weeks called Scared to Death. And it's going to be talking about how fear controls so many of our emotions. We're so afraid of what people think. We're so afraid of what might happen. We're so afraid of what it might cost. That people live their lives in slavery to fear instead of faith. And I'll tell you, everybody feels fear, but fear makes a lousy master. And it can destroy your life. So these disciples had been living in fear, and because they came to the place of deciding to follow Jesus, they came to the place of believing that he was the truth, and that it didn't matter what happened, that they were going to be okay. You see, I think about that story of the Easter morning the women came to the tomb and they saw that it was empty. The angel said, are you seeking for Jesus? And they were. And those who seek him, find him. The disciples came and they had multiple proofs over the next 40 days that Jesus was real and he was alive. 
And I, I wrestle with that question. Why do some believe and some don't? Some saw Lazarus raised from the dead. Some, some heard the story of the guards about what had happened at the resurrection tomb. And Jesus said, everybody on the side of truth listens to me. Why do some people believe and some people don't? It's not information, it's not education, it's not moral goodness. It has to do with this thing called faith. And faith is a gift that God gives you when you ask for it. And you come, there's plenty of evidence that this is the truth. But to accept the truth means a transformation of your life. And in some ways it's true. If Jesus wins, you lose. But ultimately you win. Because Jesus said if you try to hang on to your life, you're going to lose it. But if you lose your life for my sake, you will find it. Now I like to look back and say, how did it work for these guys? Everybody in this story that we just talked about is dead. You might have noticed that. Pilate was trying to hang on to his authority as the Roman governor. He lasted three years after the story. He got called back to Rome by Tiberius. And you know one of the charges? <laughs> for killing people without proper trials. That was one of the charges. He got hauled back to Rome. Tiberius died just before he got back to Rome. And the next emperor, Caligula, had Pilate go out and kill himself. He didn't last very long after this decision. What about the Jewish leaders and authorities who were trying to hang on to their country and on to their religion and on to their temple and on to their control and on to their wealth? They lasted about 35 more years and they ticked the Romans off one too many times and they came in AD 70 and they not only destroyed the government, they wiped out the whole city of Jerusalem and they destroyed the temple so that not one stone was left on another. Everything they tried to hold on to, they lost, which is exactly what Jesus said. If you hold on to your life, you're going to lose it. If you lose your life for my sake in the gospel. What happened to the disciples? This little band of maybe 120 people that are scared to death. They have no authority, have no power, they have no wealth. And yet Jesus convinces them he's alive and he gives them the job. Go and tell the rest of the world. And you know, from that 120 this weekend, there's approximately 2 billion people on this planet celebrating Easter. How did it work out for them? You see, everybody dies, and everybody gives their life for something. The question is, do you give your life for the truth? Do you give your life for what matters? Do you give your life for what lasts? Or do you just throw your life away on whatever comes by? I, I love this statement Chuck Colson was the hatchet man of Nixon's Watergate trial. For the young ones among you, Watergate was the original gate. It was before all the other gates. And Chuck Colson went to prison for that break-in. And then he became a follower of Christ and he founded a great ministry. But he stood and I heard him say this one time. It was really powerful. He said, you know why I know the resurrection is true? He says, because when Watergate happened, he said 12 of the most powerful men in the world got into a room and we pledged ourselves to lie. We said, we're going to stick together, we're going to hang together, or we're going to hang separately. So they made this plan, this strategy to lie to the world. He said, we lasted three weeks because when the pressure came and they started turning on each other and pretty quick they started coming unraveled like a cheap sweater. And it all came out, and of course, prison sentences were handed out and all kinds of things. And he said, I look at the Gospels, and that dispirited, fearful band of fishermen and tax collectors and nobodies, they saw a risen Christ, and they held that truth together for the next 30 or 40 years until each of them died for that. You see, you might be deceived and die for something that's false, but you think it's true. But you don't die for a lie. You don't die for something you know is not true. And they lived the rest of their lives as testaments to Jesus is alive, he's real, this is the truth. You don't do that if you think it might be a lie. So I want to bring it down to this meeting. There's important historic meetings. Maybe this is an important historic meeting for you. Whereas I've been talking, you and Jesus have been talking, and there's this stirring in your heart. And maybe you're in the same place Pilate was, where you say, mate, what if it's true? 
What if Jesus really is the Son of God? What if he's the only way to have an re- eternal life? What if he's the only one that can forgive my sin? What if he's the source of everything that I really need? Because I find if people are honest, everybody without Christ feels a deep sense of emptiness. What if this is the answer? And I tell you again, truth is inconvenient. It's uncomfortable. It requires us to change. But if it's the truth, it's the truth. Because Jesus said, you will know the truth and the truth will what? Set you free. You You see, well, you say I'm not even in bondage. It's like, yeah, oh, you are. You just don't know it. It will set you free. I like the meme that says, the truth will set you free, but first it will drive you crazy. Because there's often a part of that where you're wrestling with the truth. So some of you, as we come to the part of it where I challenge you to wrestle with the truth, some of you are wrestling with it maybe for the first time. Maybe you were brought here by a friend and you've been listening to me like somebody trying to sell you a timeshare condominium. (laughs) And I know that I can't convince you but it is the truth. And what Jesus said, everybody on the side of truth listens to me, and that's your choice. Will you listen to him, or will you take the convenient way out? Will you wash your hands and say, I don't have any responsibility? And Some of you maybe have been like Nicodemus, Joseph of Arimathea. You've said, I think Jesus really is the real deal. I just am afraid. I don't want to commit. I don't want to fail. I don't want people to make fun of me. I don't want to change my life. And maybe the Resurrection Day 2019 would be a great way for you to say, this is the day when I'm going to start over. I'm going to start new. I'm going to trust that this is the truth and that Christ will set me free. And some of you here today may be saying, Paul, I am a believer. I'm a follower of Jesus, but boy, have I gotten off track. I kind of walked away from church. I walked away from reading my Bible. I've walked away from an active relationship with God. And I say, you know, Easter is a wonderful time to start over. And the good thing about Jesus is he gives you a chance to start again. New life. It's a celebration, not just of Easter eggs and bunnies. It's not even a celebration just of what happened 2,000 years ago. It's a celebration that Jesus is still standing and meeting with you and saying, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Will you trust me? Will you believe? Will you let me come into your life? And if you do, I promise you, you will never be the same. You will be transformed and your life will be different. And at the end of your life, instead of living your life for things that don't matter and don't last, you will say, I know what is true and I know what is real and I know where I'm going. And there's such peace to that. Let me pray for us. God, we have a tendency to choose power and control over surrender. We choose pride over humility. We choose staying the same over learning and being changed. And quite often we choose lies over truth. And I pray that you would work right now by your spirit that there are people here that are wrestling and never believed that you really are the Son of God who's made a way for us to have a relationship with God the Father. That you have died so that our sins could be paid for and you could be set free. I pray that you'd give them faith right now in the quietness of their heart. They might say, Jesus, come into my life. Please forgive my sin. Please take over. Father, if there are people here who they do believe, but they've been hidden, they've been hiding and not wanting to be exposed as a follower of Jesus, God, give them courage to come out of the shadows, to say this is the truth. I'm going to live for the truth. And Father, for those who do know you, but they've just gotten off track, they've wandered away, they've gotten sucked into the busyness of life or maybe sucked into some sinful whirlpool, help them to start again. Help them to believe you and to follow you and to respond to you. In Jesus' name, amen. We're so glad that you're joining us by video. And uh, I know that some of you are just from our church family here, and you're uh, just watching because you can't make it this weekend in person. And I know some of you are watching from around uh, the world, really. And so we just want to say we hope that God blesses you through this. If you have questions, feel free to email me, or if you'd like to let us know 
um, that God is using this in your life. That's always encouraging, and we have several of you that, that email occasionally. So if you have questions, if you have comments, anything you can uh, give us some feedback, we'd love that, and we trust that God will use this to really enhance your spiritual journey. Thanks.